Thank you, choir. Amen, indeed. If you've been with us for any length of time, you know that we're in a series on the Holy Spirit. It's nine weeks long, and it seems like we're just scratching the surface. I'm learning a tremendous amount. I hope you are as well. I'm growing, I think. God is teaching me some things. One of the things that hasn't been directly related to any particular sermon, but just by virtue of studying the Holy Spirit, thinking about how to communicate the work of the Spirit to all of you, God's people, God's been tuning me in, as it were, helping me pay closer attention, listening to the voice of the Spirit, the prompting of the Spirit, the leading and guiding of the Spirit in my own life day to day. I meet with a group of men on Tuesday mornings for prayer and accountability and scripture memory. And one of the things this past week we agreed was the Spirit's always speaking and guiding and prompting us in some way. And sometimes the voice of the Spirit in your life is another brother or sister in Christ who's willing to tell you the truth, encourage you or challenge you. Have you had that experience before? So we've been thinking, well, what if we were all this day, this week, the voice of the Spirit for somebody? Not presuming to talk for God, but to pray and ask God, who do you want me to encourage? Who do you want me to challenge? Who do you want me to remind of your love or your grace or your gospel? Just that alone has been good for me. The Spirit doesn't take days off. He's always moving and always working in your life and through your life. Today we're going to examine a passage about the Holy Spirit that is often quoted in Christian circles. But I I don't know if it's always understood accurately what it means. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us, and then we'll begin by opening God's word. Father God, we come to you now asking you to help us by your Holy Spirit to lay aside anything that might be in our way, preventing us from hearing what you want to say. I pray the same thing for me. Lay aside anything that might prevent me from communicating clearly. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, through your living word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 12 through 20, and at least some of this I'm sure will be familiar to some of you. 1 Corinthians 6, chapter chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and also will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written... The two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I'm going to guess you've heard verse 19 before. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who's heard that verse before? I'm guessing. You either hands that up or you're just not listening to me. That's all right. (laughs) We've all heard that verse or that concept. But what does the Apostle Paul really mean? Paul is writing first of two letters to Christians, a church in Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth, instructing them. And Paul planted this church, established it. We read about that in Acts chapter 18 and 19. And now he's heard about some issues. You know, sometimes people will say things like the early church, the first century church, the New Testament church, they really had things right. We've got to get back to the way the early church was. If reading 1 Corinthians teaches you anything, it teaches us that the early church had issues. The church has always had issues. Do you know why? It's full of people, (laughs) and people have issues. President, company, not excluded. Paul is writing this letter to instruct them to address some of those issues. Now, the context of chapter 6 there is sexual immorality. We'll talk about that in a minute. But mostly, it's it's a litany of things that are going wrong in this church. You'll see an image here on the screen of the map of Corinth, or where Corinth is located in the ancient world. 
It's on an isthmus uh, down from mainland Greece. It was one of the major city-states in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ancient Greece. It was a key city in the Greco-Roman Empire because of its, uh, it was on a trade route. Very wealthy, very cosmopolitan, very progressive in the ancient world. In Greek mythology, the founder of the city was Sisyphus. Who knows their Greek mythology and what Sisyphus, this is fun to say Sisyphus, what Sisyphus was famous for? What was Sisyphus famous for? Remember rolling the boulder up the great hill? His punishment in Hades is to roll the boulder up the hill, and then every night it would roll back down again. That was his, what he did for eternity. Sisyphus' grandson, who has a name I also cannot pronounce, rode Pegasus, which became the symbol of the city in the ancient world. Known for the wide variety of temples and shrines to numerous gods, even more so than Athens, where Paul was in Acts 17. Aphrodite, Demeter, Poseidon, Hera. But the dominant temple was the Temple of Apollos. Or Apollo, excuse me. That below the mountain there, on the, that, that little remnant of those pillars, is the, what's left of the great temple to Apollo. The city had a reputation for temple prostitution and sexual promiscuity in general. In fact, in the ancient world, it, to call someone Corinthian was not a compliment. It was to say, you're pretty loose with your body. You're so Corinthian. Didn't refer to where you lived. It referred to your sexual promiscuity. Corinth was something akin to Las Vegas of the ancient world. Sin City. Wealthy, pagan, promiscuous, where anything goes. And then Paul plants this young gospel community, the church in this city. And he writes now to address some issues they're having, not surprisingly. And the argument Paul uses here in chapter 6 to deal with sexual immorality is the same argument he uses throughout the letter, particularly in the first six chapters, to deal with other things. Look at first chap uh, chapter 3 for, with me for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Before we read this passage, let me just tell you, this is the section where Paul is talking about divisions in the church. You see, what happened in this church was some people remember Paul and were saying, we follow Paul. Apollos, another teacher, rose up in the church and others were saying, we like Apollos' teaching better. This should never happen here at Chapel Street Church. We follow Jeff, we follow Sterling, we follow Andrew. Uh-uh, we follow Jesus. Paul's saying, you don't follow human beings. This is where he famously says, one, one plants and other waters, but God makes things grow. And then, to sort of drive home the point about Division should not be in the church. Verse 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Does that sound familiar to something we just read in verse 19 of chapter 6? I hope you're paying attention to this. So the argument against division, the rationale, the line of reasoning is the same line of reasoning Paul uses against sexual morality. Don't you know? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, he uses this numerous times. In Ephesians, which we studied earlier this year, Paul says against racism and prejudice in the church, Jew-Gentile division, he says, don't you know? You, you are God's building, God's temple, in which he lives by his spirit. This is really important for you to get. The fascinating thing is that Paul uses the same line of reasoning to combat almost every issue in the church. Now, when it comes to racism, prejudice, division, I think contemporary people in, in our culture would say, yay, Paul, that's right, racism's bad, prejudice is bad, go get those people being divisive, that's right. But when Paul uses the exact same argument to talk about sexual purity, I think our culture goes, whoa, hey, Paul, that's a little intrusive. That's a little regressive, Paul. I mean, you're being, I mean, that's a little extreme. But it's the same argument. What is the argument? Don't you know? Let's read verses 19 and 20 of chapter 6 again. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Don't you know, Paul asked this question, that you, in fact, you should go through 1 Corinthians and underline the number of times Paul says, don't you know. 
All the time he's saying this, asking these rhetorical questions. Don't you know? To understand what Paul's really saying here, we need to understand what temples were and what they were for. Temples were everywhere in the ancient world. Some of you, I just mentioned the story of Paul uh, establishing the church in Corinth is in Acts 18. In Acts 17, Paul visits the city of Athens in mainland Greece, and we know the famous story of him. He's sort of waiting for his friends to arrive, and he's walking through the city, and he observes all of the shrines and temples. He even sees one, a temple to an unknown god. So to an ancient person, to say it, the, the concept of temple was common. They were everywhere. But they're a bit foreign to us, lost to us. Clearly, Paul sees whatever the, this means, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul sees this as having the capacity to transform your life. How you treat people, right? Division. Your own internal purity and integrity. And to transform us collectively. This concept is crucial to Paul's understanding of what it means to be the church and to follow Jesus. In the ancient world, a temple was sacred space. It was the place where heaven and earth intersected, where they crossed over. It was the place where the human and the divine met, where you went to encounter God, offer sacrifices to God, meet with God, offer prayers, placate the gods. It was it, across ancient cultures, the place where you went to encounter the divine, where heaven and earth met. Now, remember who Paul was before he's Paul. He's Saul of Tarsus, and he studied under a man named Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. He was steeped in the Jewish scriptures and traditions. So where and what is the temple to a Jew? It's not many temples, like there were in these Greco-Roman cities. There's only one temple. Now, I worked hard to space all this out, but I hope it works. There was only one temple to the Jewish mind. And that temple was where? Jerusalem, the Jewish temple. And by the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, there had been a temple or something akin to the temple standing in Jerusalem for a thousand years. There are about a thousand years. That's a long time. Years ago when I went to the Czech Republic, I stood on the Charles Bridge, which was 900 years old. And it was, the, it was remarkable. When our cult, in our country, if something's 200 years old, we think it's ancient. A thousand years the temple had been there, the Jewish people, the place where you went to encounter God, to meet with God, the place where, where God's spirit dwelled by his... That, now, now I have a dirty finger. <laughs> the temple in Jerusalem, the place where we went to offer sacrifices and to meet with God. For the Jew, and it's, it's hard for us. It would be almost impossible to overstate the significance of the temple to the ancient Jews, to the Jewish mind. It was, think... Um, Statue of Liberty, Washington Monument, and White House all rolled into one and add overwhelming religious significance to those things. And you get a glimpse maybe of what it meant to, to them. It was their national monument. It was the symbol of their identity as a people. It told their story as a people. It was the place they met, went to meet with God, a symbol of God's presence among them. The temple was everything to the Jewish mind. Now, how, when Paul says then, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We think we kind of get what he means. He says, don't you know? The truth is, they probably did not know. And frankly, I'm not sure we do either. It'd be like me saying, you are the White House. You are the Statue of Liberty. What, what? No, I know, I'm not. I know where that is. It's in Jerusalem. That's in New York City. That's in Washington, D.C. That's not me. Paul's saying something radical here. You are the temple. This, the temple told their story. The temple building itself told the story of God's goodness to his people, his pursuit of his people, his presence with his people, his desire to dwell with his people. And this, by the way, is the primary story of the whole Bible. God dwelling with his people. Think about how the story begins. How does the story begin? Genesis 1 and 2. Right? In the garden. This is exactly what the tree of life looked like. I have it. We find that God creates a man in his image. He calls that man Adam. Ha Adam is the Hebrew word for man. And whenever you see drawings of Adam and Eve, they're always covered by bushes, which is a good thing. 
but they probably weren't in those days. Adam and Eve, dwelling in perfect harmony with their creator. I don't know if she had a 50s haircut, but she does in my drawing. <laughs> that God dwelled with them in perfect harmony in the garden. The presence of God with his people. That's the whole point. God made us in his image to be in relationship with him, our creator. Of course, it's not even two chapters, just two chapters and into the third when we mess this up. And the rest of the story of the Bible could be sort of summarized by saying it's how God then continues to pursue us. Why? To punish us? To get us for our wrongdoing? No. To be with us. To dwell again with his people. The presence of God with his people. This is the promise throughout the Old Testament. And of course, some of you know what precedes the temple in the Old Testament. The tabernacle, which is the crazy, weird, giant tent in the wilderness. Again, this is exactly what the tabernacle looked like. The word tabernacle is from a Latin word, tabernaculum. It's, it's a Roman word referring to like the tents that they would pitch, the Roman legions. But it, it means tent, but it literally means dwelling place. Mishka is the Hebrew word. It means place, place of dwelling. So God, in other words, is coming to dwell with his people. And of course, they would be offering sacrifices in the tabernacle, so you always had this smoke rising up from that in the wilderness. God dwelling with his people. The presence of God lost from sin. The presence of God symbolically, this, this traveling tabernacle. And when you read through Exodus 25 and 26 and 27, which is the instructions for how to construct the tabernacle, do you know what you find in there? You find that God tells the Israelites to put on the great curtain in the inside separating the Holy of Holies from them two golden cherubim with flaming swords. What does that remind you of? What happens in the garden when we sin? A cherubim guarding the way, right, with a flaming sword. And then we find there's pomegranates and there's these beautiful designs all to be woven into the fabric of the tabernacle. To do what? It's a symbol of, like, it's a, it's a callback, as it were, to the garden. You lost God's presence because of your sin, but now he, he desires to be with you. Symbolically, it's to symbolize he desires to be with you, the place where God dwells among his people. And of course, then when they enter the promised land, they no longer have to pack up this tent to carry it with them. It becomes permanent in the temple, the symbol of God's presence with his people. This is all in Paul's mind. But he writes, don't you know you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? The problem, of course, was the people of Israel, the Jews, they confused the symbol with the reality to which it pointed. They got so focused on the building, on the structure, they forgot the build, what the building represented. And it's always been part of the story. The building represented what? God's presence with his people. Of course, we would never get too fixated on a building or a structure today. This has always been an issue. And in Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah the weeping prophet gives this sermon called the Temple Sermon. And basically he stands up in the temple and says, this place is a sham. You come here and you go through the motions, you offer your sacrifices, you do your religious duties, and then you go home and you sleep with your neighbor's wife. You cheat your workers out of their fair wages. You mistreat each other. It's a sham, in other words. In other words, true worship of God is not just what you do when you're in this building. It's how you live your life. This is only to symbolize God with you and the price paid for your sin. You can't come here and, and offer the blood of bulls and goats and then go home and live any way you want. This is Jeremiah's, my, my summation of his sermon. So when Jesus then comes on the scene, we know this story in John chapter 2, and he goes into the temple and he fashions a whip out of cords and drives out the money changers. He's doing, he's, he's behaving in line with the prophet Jeremiah. It's a fascinating thing. And then Jesus says some other things which we need to understand if we're going to know what Paul means when he says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Look with me at John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
The English translation might be a bit misleading. The word, word is capitalized there because it refers to Jesus, the logos of God, the word of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the word was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. That's John 1, 1 and 2. What does that remind you of? Creation. God with his people. And then John tells us in verse 14, the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelled among us. The word there is tabernacled. Pitched his tent, set up camp in the flesh among us. Remember what the whole story of the Bible is. God coming to dwell with his people. And then, in John chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, this is... Actually, the part after when Jesus drives out the money changes the temple, clears the temple, turns over the tables with the, with the whip, Jesus answered them. That the Pharisees say, what, what right do you have to do this? Who do you think you are, Jesus? And here's his answer. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? And then in verse 21, which is not on the screen, but it is in your Bible, John the writer, the author, kind of whispers in our ear. He was speaking about his body. Right? So we go from the garden, God's presence, the symbolic presence in the tent, to the physical temple. Jesus comes on the scene, and he says, now the presence of God, the temple, is not that anymore. It's what? That's not how Jesus' hair looks, I'm pretty sure. The temple is Jesus himself, his body. He's talking about himself. He is the temple now. In other words, what? He's the sacred space. He's the place you meet with God on earth. He is the presence of God with his people. That Jesus now is the place where you go to meet with God. You want to meet God? Go to Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God, Colossians tells us. He's the firstborn of all creation. Anyone who's seen him has seen the Father, he says to his disciples. He's the presence of God. He's the sacred space. Jesus is the place where heaven and earth intersect. This is profound stuff. All this is in Paul's mind when he tells us that we're the temple. Jesus answered to them when they say, what gives you the right to overturn these tables and disrupt our worship? Jesus says, I am the temple. And they're like, huh? And he says, he's talking about his body. He's the place you meet with God. And then we've been learning in John 14 through 16 the farewell discourse, the goodbye discourse between Jesus and his disciples in the upper room. He says to them, I'm going away, and that's actually good for you. Do you remember this? Why is it good for you? Because I will send to you another helper, alos parakletos in Greek, meaning another of the same kind. And you will know me in a more personal, intimate way by the spirit that lives in you than you would if I was standing next to you. What does this tell us? What is the church referred to later in 1 Corinthians 12? The what of Christ? The body. Jesus says, I'm going away. And it's for your good that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Spirit won't come. And the Spirit is the one that's going to guide you into all truth. It's going to make you one. That's going to establish you in my truth and grace. And going to move in you to preach good news to the world. We're now part of the church in the world. Remember what the story of the Bible is. God dwelling with his people. Lost by our sin. Symbolically established as they wander in the wilderness in the tabernacle. Permanently established, somewhat permanently, right? By the physical temple in Jerusalem. Replaced by Jesus who says, all this is pointing to me. I'm the sacrifice. I'm the way you connect with God. And then he goes away and says, the Spirit's coming to live in you. You collectively and, that was like Frankenstein, and you individually. Apologies, I can't make a unisex person. That now the Spirit comes to live in you. So when Paul says, you are the temple, he's saying, 
you are the, you collectively the church, the body of Christ by the Spirit, and you individually. Because in Ephesians 2, we're told that the Spirit is a seal in us, indwelling each individual believer. Can you see, what is Paul saying then in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, when he's talking about temple prostitution? What's happening here is these Christian men in the church, because they live in this city where it's common, think, I have new freedom in Christ, I'm forgiven. I guess I can still go to the temple and do my thing. And Paul's saying, don't you know? Your life now, your heart now, is the place where heaven and earth intersect. Your life is now sacred space. Your life individually and your life collectively is the place where people encounter God. Do you ever think of that? When he says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, this is a profound thing. This is why in Romans 12:1, the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Where is the place where sacrifices are made? Where do you make sacrifices? All right. Where is that now? The temple sacrifices from the Old Testament law were made once for all at the cross in Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb. Now where are sacrifices offered? Not for sin, that's done. In your life. Your life is a living sacrifice, Paul says. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians verse 20, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. I've told this story before, but years ago, a friend of mine who has moved away from here now, God had really brought him out of a life of addiction and anger and, and really brokenness, and he was walking with Jesus and growing, but he would, he would occasionally have these moments where he would kind of be his old self, fall back into his old behavior. One particular time involved just his real, real anger at an injustice he felt was being done to his family. He called me, and he was talking crazy on the phone. I mean, like threatening to do things that not even, not even known Christian man should do, you just shouldn't be talking about. We met for coffee, and I looked him right in the eye, and didn't plan to say this, but this verse came right to my mind, and I said, you can't do that. And he said, why? Why can't I? I said, because you're not your own. You're bought with a price. His, his, it was like the light went on for him. He went, that's right. We still talk about that day. What does it mean? Well, at the very least, it means you don't call the shots in your life anymore. You know, when you get married, men, you realize that uh, my decisions affect other people now. They always did, but now it becomes acutely personal, right? Now my decisions are impacting her. I can't just do what I want anymore. And if you do that, you're going to have a lousy marriage. Well, when the Spirit comes to live inside of you and makes your body the temple, you don't get to call the shots anymore. You are not your own. You belong to another. There's someone else who's in charge. Second, here's something else that it means. It means what goes into your life, your mind, your heart, your mouth, what you take in in every way, matters. There were very strict rules about what could and could not be present in the temple. Paul says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which comes from God. Would you, would you, would you think it's okay to have guests over and have dinner in the bathroom? How many of you would say, that'd be fine. Why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Because it's gross, right? And I don't have to explain to you that it's gross, you just know it's gross, right? funny that we brush our teeth in the bathroom, but anyway, that's another thing. We should brush our teeth in the kitchen. I'm getting off the subject. My point is, there are certain things you just know. Those don't belong there. You don't do that there. The same thing is true in your life, Paul says. Don't you know? Don't you know? And also, what comes out of your life, your mouth, your service, your life, matters. This is the living sacrifice idea. Give yourselves, offer yourselves to God. And then finally, I mentioned this before, but now your life, friends, my life, our collective life as a church, if the temple is the place where God lives with his people, if, if the whole story of the Bible is God coming to dwell with his people, and that was in the garden, replaced symbolically by the tabernacle, then the temple, then Jesus himself in the flesh, now what? 
the church and you. If you get nothing else, I hope you get this. Paul is saying, you, me, us, those who belong to Jesus, you are now the place on this earth, in this time, where people encounter God. You are now the place where people meet, where the divine and human meet in your life. He will come again to judge the world and restore all things in righteousness and establish his presence forever for all eternity with his people perfectly. Between this time and that time, Paul says, you're the temple. You're the place where God dwells in your heart, not inside this building, in us, in the world. Now, I can't make every application of that truth for your life. I'm struggling to make them for my own. But I want to encourage you to think on that this week. Paul asked the question of the Corinthian Christians. I think he asked it of us. Don't you know? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the spirit within you which God gave you? You're not your own. Honor God with your body. Honor God with your life. Now, we're going to finish appropriately by coming to the table. The symbolic place where we know how we can meet with God. The place that reminds us of his great sacrifice and love for us through Jesus Christ. And we say this every time we observe communion, but if you're here and you have trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, it doesn't matter if you're a member of our church, if it's your first Sunday here, if you've been here since you were a fetus, it doesn't matter. If you know Jesus Christ and have placed your trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins, and you're willing to examine your own heart before you come to the table, then you're welcome because it's not our table, it's his. We welcome you. Let's pray and prepare our hearts. God, we thank you that your great desire is to live with us, to dwell with us and in us. And even though we sin and rebel and run away and ignore, you pursue us. You never stop pursuing. We thank you now as we come to your table, the great symbol of how you pursued us all the way to the cross. That's the depth of your love. Speak the words we need to hear as we speak back to you. Words of honesty and grace and truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he passed it among his disciples. And passed to you. He said, this is my body. And it's given for you. Let's eat this in his memory. The Bible also teaches us that after the disciples had finished eating together, Jesus poured out a cup, saying to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. One of my favorite things about celebrating communion with all of you is this. Not only do we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us individually, but we proclaim his love collectively. Let's proclaim his love and grace together. Can't even sing that chorus without thinking about 1 Corinthians 6. That you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You're bought with a price, a price of love and a price of grace. We do this every week or every month, excuse me, but if you came prepared to give to the benevolent offering, I want to remind you as you leave, the ushers will receive that, and that money goes directly to meet the needs of people in our church family and in our broader community who are really hurting. So thank you for your generosity. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of the one who gave his all for you, that you might live and give your life for him. Amen. And go in peace.